Uh, Slavoj, welcome to the show. Uh, I know that you have a lot to say about the Russian Revolution, and I definitely want to specifically ask you about the period between February and October in a minute. Um, but we were talking before the show, and you mentioned that it's it's basically impossible, of course, to understand the events that we'll be talking about in a minute without talking about World War I. Uh, so, so when we're thinking about the Russian Revolution, where should we begin and why should we start with World War I? Because uh, we, we tend to forget today, obsessed as we are with Hitler, World War II, Holocaust, and so on, that how important World War I was. Before World War I, only in Western Europe, of course, there was for 50, 60 years a period of relative peace, progress, even gradual good reforms, uh, Bismarck, of all guys, in Germany, introduced uh, uh, first retirement plans, elements of social security, suffragettes, feminist movement in uh, in United Kingdom, and so on. And the enigma, even today for historians, is how comes that then, all of a sudden, 1914, it exploded into a tragedy. Of course, this tragedy was preparing itself from before. But here things get complex. Do you know that for 20 years before 1914, even more, uh, everybody was talking about possible European conflict, but nobody took the possibilities seriously. Uh, uh, It's kind of, you know, rationally, you see it may happen, but you don't believe it really can happen. Although, on the other hand, there were some absolute geniuses, and since usually people uh, dismiss angles, as you know, the poor stupid guy marks the true genius, uh, one should emphasize here, and maybe I even already mentioned in some previous show, he, shows here, but because we, the remaining half Marxist, whatever you call us, like to but, uh, we are often reproached how, okay, some interesting theories in Marx, but usually they are uh, a mess as far as we go into empirical predictions. Do you know what absolute genius Engels was in a letter from 1882? He wrote to a journalist that the way things look, uh, in a couple of decades, there will be an all European war. The cost will be 10 million lives, dead corpses, you know what's today the official number? 9,800,000. Then he said that in the, uh, Germany will probably lose, and it will be France and United Kingdom against Germany, and on the other side, Russia against Germany. And uh, he said maybe the result will be Engels, a uh, revolution in Russia, And then comes the true stroke of a genius. He adds that uh, if Germany loses the war, it's a high probability that in around two decades, there will be another. (laughs) It's breathtaking. Engels had an incredible uh, practical sense. No, we Marxists are not the stupid guys who have our dreams and so on. It was so... uh, 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 All this, even Lenin saw this clearly, that there is a chance. He was nervous. Although at the beginning, we must admit, Lenin was surprised. We all know the well-known story of the big betrayal of European social democracy. A part of two parties, Russian Bolsheviks, and one must say this because we all know when you say Serbia, you think about Milosevic and so on. And uh, Serb social democrats were the only two social democracies which voted against war credits, didn't fall into this patriotic uh, uh, torrent, whatever. <laughs> so uh, you know the story. Just to get it clear how, what a surprise this was, that when Lenin got the German, he was already in Switzerland, I don't know where, the, the newspapers announcing the German social democracy voted for the war credits, he was sure that these were fake news. 
that secret services printed these newspapers that it couldn't happen, and so on and so on. But then Lenin did what in the moment of deepest crisis and defeat every great leftist does. He moved to a secluded place, uh, 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 Switzerland, and started begin reading Hegel, among <laughs> other things. No? And, and Etienne Balibar, in a good analysis, demonstrated how, what we, it's a nice paradox, what we usually perceive as Hegel's, sorry, as uh, Lenin's uh, opportunism. Like, we should never forget, but we'll come to this later, that uh, Lenin knew how to analyze the situation and find big, uh, weak leaks. Like, like for Lenin, uh, the motto was not proletarian revolution. The motto was peace and freedom, free, uh, and, uh, freedom and land to the farmers, and so on, you know. So uh, he saw an opportunity, Lenin. Uh, especially he saw the big failure of the social uh, of the uh, social democracy. Maybe just to finish with this World War I, you know why this is important? Because we tend to forget today with all this focus, and it is an indescribable horror of Holocaust, World War II, what horrors were nonetheless happening in the, in the 19th century, century, when imperialism was fully blowing, progressing, and so on. Like, uh, sorry if I repeat myself here, uh, but it's so important to know this. Like, when people say, but never there were such mechanized mass murders and so on. Yeah, but are we just aware, if we look at them from today's perspective, are we aware of the indescribable horror for example, of the Opium War, 1842-44 in China. What people don't know, they usually think, yeah, China was a country in inertia, weakened already. No, in 1820, China was by far the strongest economy in the world. Not per capita, it was United Kingdom, but brutal altogether. And you know, it was the second strongest economy in the world, India, hmm. at that point. And then it was the result of colonization that first India went to ruin. It's also not true what some say, but nonetheless, British colonization to India brought uh, organization and some no. In 19th century, there were much stronger hungers and chaos under British colonization. They just learned did what they already learned in Ireland, how to simply isolate the part where hunger is. But let's not lose time with this. What I want to say is that what happened, my God, is that then it was the big business uh, of exchange tea for opium. The British, to be brutal, didn't like English, sorry, didn't like uh, Indian tea. They preferred the Chinese tea. To pay it, they were selling opium to China. And it was an incredible human catastrophe. I mean, millions of people addicted and so on. So then the Chinese emperor, a relatively progressive young guy, wrote to Queen Victoria, pleading her, look, my, 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 my society is destroyed. She even didn't answer him. So he just prohibited the import of opium. Declaration of war from uh, England, some other countries. You know, with what excuse? And I'm coming to my joke. It's incredible. The excuse was that uh, free trade is the basis of civilization. So if you prohibit free trade, you make a step into barbarism, and it's a duty of civilized nation by even by a war to to bring you back into com into shared market. Now, you know, what is the result of this? Uh, in 20 years later, around 1845-50, do you know that Chinese brutal product fell by two-thirds? What was the strongest economy? It was simply chaotic, impoverished, and so on. Okay, I will not go into details. Just one more thing is worth mentioning here. 
sorry, I cannot resist saying this. It's a beautiful sarcasm. Uh, when people tell me, but okay, things were done like this at that point, you know, my answer is this one. Uh, uh, but imagine, since humanitarians like to measure the humanitarian record of other countries with today's standards. Okay, let's apply today's standards to United Kingdom. And I like this dream. I once used this in Mexico, I got an applause. Today, the big bad guy, guys are cartels from Colom uh, uh, Col uh, uh, Colombia and Mexico. What if they were to exert a force on their country to declare war on countries so that Mexico and Colombia would declare war on the United States for trying to prevent the peaceful export of opium <laughs> and other drugs? So that's what was done at that mm -hmm. point. We, when we uh, are so focused on 20th century horrors, we tend to lose from sight the absolutely breathtaking horror of it. That's, uh, it, okay, let's not get lost, but what I, what my point is this one. It wasn't just the war. It was the end of a certain model of development to which even Engels, now comes the relatively bad news on Engels, uh, 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 a trap, into which even Engels got caught when in around 1800, towards the end of his life, 91 to, he wrote a well-known uh, introduction, I forgot to which text, I think class warfare in France, where he says, maybe, it was the time when a German social democracy was winning votes, maybe there even, we will even not need a revolution, maybe simply, gradually, we will win, on, by voting, and there will be a peaceful tradition. Another mistake of Engels, which is especially actual for us today, is that he was obsessed with standard image of who is a proletarian. You know, that's an interesting mm -hmm. analysis in every epoch. One, one specific strata becomes the symbol of proletarian. At that time, I would say it was either steel workers or miners or something like that. Like that's the true working class. And uh, Engels didn't see enough how already at that point, third world exploitation and things like this were integral part of capitalism. The only way to understand capitalism is not, not to focus on this most developed modern proletariat, but to include all those, to use terms of David Harvey, whose work is non-valorized. It's women, it's those whose, uh, whose environment is ruined, and so on and so on. You know where uh, this Engels mistake uh, shows clearly? Like, till the end of his life, he was opposed I don't care about it. I'm not a nationalist, but our enemies here use this all the time. Engels was opposed to too much freedom for southern Slavs, Slovenes, Croats, mm -hmm. and so on. In a way, he was right to oppose it, because he all European left remember how, without the interventions, not so much of Russia, as also of Croats, Slovenes, who were on the emperor's side, the 1848 revolution, may even had a chance to succeed. But what Engels, so Engels thought as he wrote, I don't care about Southern Slavs there, I only worry about them so that they will not prevent the success of another revolution with Europe. For, for Engels, the big point was the liberation, self-emancipation of the working class. And I think all these traditional, one has to, has to say this, Marxist vision, was also interrupted, disintegrated with World War I. It wasn't, this is just an uh, aberration, then we will get that to the, uh, to the old, uh, 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 old class war warfare and so on and so on. No, no, everything changed. And I think Lenin clearly saw this, that, the, that it's not just 
a short break, then we will return to all social democratic struggles and so on and so on. Lenin saw the fundamental change. And what is so interesting in Lenin is that he didn't regress already the relatively early Lenin into uh, some kind of a primitive anti-Euro centric idea of Europe as such is corrupted. No, even towards the end of his life, when he saw the desperate situation in Russia, Lenin says, let's not dream about building socialism. Our task today is just to bring, he even says in Eurocentric terms, you know, a little bit more of haha, European civilization and so on to, to Russia and so on. But what Lenin clearly saw is that World War I was a break, that everything, everything changed, you know. And this is, if I may slowly progress now to your question, uh, this is what uh, guys whom I otherwise respect, even if they hate me, like uh, Noam Chomsky don't see. I remember listening to an interview by, uh, or even a podcast by Chomsky, who, as typical liberal leftists, no, says uh, Bolsheviks did just uh, were a small group who did a coup d'etat. The true Marxists were the Mensheviks, who simply followed the official Marxist dogma, which is this succession of stages. No, the idea was how can Russia do a more radical revolution when they are not even properly in the bourgeois revolution? So. The situation is not yet right. The first revolution, this meant February, must be a bourgeois revolution, bourgeois democracy, develop capitalism. We need to create the proletariat and then we will do it. Lenin, uh, first, this is not, incidentally, this is not an adequate image. Read history precisely of those months. And you see that, yes, on the one hand, Lenin may appear as a madman who, in his famous April thesis, saw and advocated the possibility of a revolution. But, he, but although, even at some point, the majority of the Bolshevik, uh, whatever it was called, Politburo, Central Committee members, although they, uh, although they, uh, uh, well, Bolsheviks were revolution, they thought Lenin is going crazy. Even his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, wrote to, I don't know whom, is Vladimir Ilyich getting to mm. the psychiatrist and so on, you know. But on the other hand, it's not just this. Uh, there was a magic moment when Lenin, far from being an isolated madman, building his paranoia construct revolution, got support from the base. There was so much desperate misery. People were so desperate that you couldn't tell them Look, guys, your time didn't yet come. Wait a little bit. It's in the next... Fa you know, Lenin was here, although he would probably never admit it. Uh, Lenin was here already thinking at the level of Walter Benjamin, that the big thing is... This was Benjamin's big obsession, to get rid of these gradual phases... Uh, in, of revolutionary movement. First this phase, then another phase. No, that's what Lenin learned in, from Hegel, who is usually dismissed as the great uh, uh, <coughs> madman of <coughs> everything except us. No, precisely this <coughs> contingency and non-contemporaneity of philosophy, oh, sorry, of historical development. Yes, there are phases, but sometimes contradictions are get condensed in one situation. And then uh, Lenin, in a way, saw, although I'm also very critical on Marx, but Lenin also saw how uh, if, if in the long term you want to promote proletarian revolution, if you want to be faithful to this, moments come where the only thing to do is to say, no, another struggle is at this point crucial more important than the proletarian struggle. And to cut short, don't be afraid <laughs> that I will go on and on. That's why uh, what Lenin made mistakes, we can talk about this later, but what I admire about him at this point, at the beginning, 
before and then immediately after October Revolution is that he was not in this empty sense, but effectively non-dogmatic. Do you know how many mm. parts of the official Marxist evolutionary dogma he violated? He made the revolution again by appeals to slogans, uh, 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 peace, land reform, and so on, which even had nothing specifically Marxist about them. But he saw at that point, that's how you, that's how you mobilize people. So uh, this is what I see, this uh, great, great in Lenin. This, this was an immense achievement, whatever, whichever horror later took place on behalf of Lenin. Yeah. A, this absolute this trust of simple evolutionary logic that you know, step by step. No, Lenin saw clearly what now some post-colonial big, uh, guys like to emphasize, that at some point, uh, con- at some point, even conservative forces, not conservative in the bourgeois or feudal sense, but in the sense of old local traditions can serve as a support for a radical break with the present. Because we should never forget that capitalism is not only trying to thwart every radical step forward, but it's also immensely destructive, as it were, backwards, towards traditional forms. Lenin saw all, Lenin saw clearly all this. So this insight against evolutionary logic and this incredible sense to <laughs> grab an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Lenin was, as Lukács, who is also reproached for being dogmatic, in his book After History and Class Consciousness, Lenin, points out uh, Lenin is precisely not this evolutionary thinker, uh, general logic of history, let's do no. Uh, Lenin uh, saw clearly that there is a unique chance in Russia and that if they, Bolsheviks, miss that chance, the cause will be lost for decades, 30, 40, maybe 50 years and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm. This is what I admire with Lenin and I will tell you why and then I will stop. Because I think something similar happened uh, in in 1990 in Europe the decline or disintegration of these European communist regimes. I had no sympathy for them, but remember that at the same time, social democracy as we knew it, welfare state and so on and so on. And we need a similar, I know the term is crazy, radical opportunism today. Radical in the sense of we don't abandon, not by a bit our goal, but opportunism in the sense of you look around, you see where contradictions are, you grab, you grab the situation. Mm-hmm. That's the, the incredible sense needed more than ever today of Lenin. Yeah. And that, that's what I, uh, I always find striking is that, you know, he was both a, this man of letters, this very, you know, well, well-read, well spoken, well, you know, excellent writer, thinker, et cetera, but also a man of action um, in a way that seems um, almost totally impossible to imagine today, uh, uh, like a man like that, a man that is both, um, you know, an intellectual, for lack of a better term, and also this kind of incredible man of action that just seems like totally anachronistic uh, today, totally impossible. Um, you know, I, 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 I just wonder, like, if, you know, why, why was it possible back then and it's not now? Like, why can't that kind of person exist now? I have now? my own almost a conspiracy theory, a mythic theory. <laughs> you know that at that point, especially the middle of Europe, a little bit of Paris, Germany, Vienna, was, it's a primitive sociological theory, was a miraculous place. Adorno, uh, uh, when he analyzes in some of his writings for it, Vienna around 1900 and later, and says precisely because of the relative backwardness of the Austrian-Hungarian empire, because intelligent, active people didn't have a proper space in economy or in state apparatus 
to realize their potentials. You have this incredible explosion of geniuses there. Freud, modern painting, uh, uh, um, social theory, uh, 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 physics, uh, Einstein, and so on and so on. That it, again, Lenin would have loved to do this analysis of how the very apparent backwardness of this central European space, the backwardness which had its own traps, of course. Don't forget that Hitler is uh, from this space. Don't forget that uh, I learned this when I was in Linz, in the middle of Austria. Do you know that Hitler and Wittgenstein were visiting young Hitler and young Wittgenstein, the same high school gymnasium, gymnasium there. And there is even a stupid theory, totally not right, that Hitler saw what a genius Wittgenstein is and out of envy became anti-Semite or whatever, you know. But I think you are pointing in the right direction. You see, that's the spirit of Lenin. Let's not say this is the progress of history. Oh, this is the most progressive part their thing will happen. No, sometimes the true break comes precisely from the less developed part. As even mm. Hegel hinted and Marx knew, the top movement of philosophy 100 years ago was Germany, precisely because it missed the revolution, French Revolution, and so on. You know, mm. that's, that's what, that, was, uh, that was the spirit of Lenin. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thanks.